Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 360th episode, we have a bunch of news, including what is now the oldest known theropod from the UK. Nice. Yeah, it's pretty cool. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Nashoi Bidasaurus. Which you might have heard us briefly mention in our Hadrosaurtastic episode, episode 350. I don't remember it. There were a lot of dinosaurs in that episode. It was a brief mention. (laughs) And of course, we have a fun fact. But before we get into all of that, first, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we have a new patron that's Painted Horse. Thank you very much for joining. And we also have some returning patrons and they're Dino Mo, Kyle, Morgan Eklov, Rhinosaurus, A Moose, Trev, and Kylo Solis, John Heck, and James Pascoe. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for being part of our community. I love hearing these shout outs every week. So if you want to join and get your own shout out and also be a part of our growing community of fellow dinosaur enthusiasts, then check out our page. It's patreon.com slash I know dino. Jumping into the news, we've got our new dinosaur. It was published in Royal Society Open Science and written by Stefan Speakman and others. And in it, they describe a new coelophysoid or, quote, the first named unambiguous theropod from the Triassic of the UK. Oh, yeah, this one had a lot of headlines. It did, and I think rightfully so. It's very interesting. And, you know, being the first unambiguous theropod from the Triassic of the UK also makes it basically the oldest theropod known from the UK. I mean, there are other pieces of theropod bones, but as I said, unambiguous and named means that we know what it is Mm -hmm. (laughs) rather than it just being like, yeah, there was some theropod there. So there might be evidence of theropods before this in the UK, but we have no idea what they are outside of them just being theropods. And this one was specifically whales, right? Yes. Yeah, it's in whales. It was also kind of funny, as Weiser pointed out in our Discord, the Guardian (laughs) described it as, quote, a dinosaur distantly related to Tyrannosaurus rex. In that all theropods are related? Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Because in this case, they lived over 150 million years apart and on opposite sides of the earth. And they're also completely different sizes and on different lineages. So yeah, they're not really related very much. Basically, it's like if there was a paper about a new whale or a mouse, and they said a mammal distantly related to humans. It's like, yeah, but that doesn't really tell you anything. It's like all mammals are distantly related to each other. But what does that have to do with anything? Yeah, maybe. I think theropods in general have more in common than all mammals. So this new dinosaur is basically, as my dino nerd description, is more like it's a miniature coelophysis. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about something roughly (laughs) chicken-sized, which is, you know, a couple pounds compared to a T-Rex, which is multiple tons. Right. And yes, they both have, they're both bipedal and they both have... Teeth and claws. Yeah. So they have that in common. So I guess in my comparison with mouse and whales, they don't have the same general body plan. Mm -hmm. But maybe if you said a new monkey (laughs) distantly or a new lemur distantly related to humans, that would be more like it. Because it's like, yeah, they're bipedal and they have eyes and teeth (laughs) and they're omnivores (laughs) and they have fur. Although I don't even know if this thing would have feathers. So they might not even have the same sort of overall body covering. But anyway. This new dinosaur is named Pendrag Milnere, or Milnery, and Pendrag is Welsh. Pen means chief, and Drag means dragon. So combined, it literally means chief dragon. But in medieval Welsh, that use of chief dragon was used to mean chief warrior. Hmm. So Pendrag, or maybe Drag, if you want to make it a little more Welsh, essentially means like the chieftain of a group makes sense early theropod yeah and you know whales is all about their dragon so it Mm -hmm. makes sense that they would include that in sort of their hierarchy and then the anglicized version of pendrag is pendragon which was the nickname of king arthur's father in the legend so there you go very little about king arthur's father yeah me too or me neither (laughs) then milnery or milnery 
is in honor of Dr. Angela C. Milner, quote, in recognition of her major contributions to vertebrate paleontology, including as one of the leading experts on British theropod dinosaur fossils and to the Natural History Museum London, where the type specimen is held. That's nice. There seems to be a lot of dinosaurs named in her honor lately. Yeah, she was clearly a huge influence on a lot of people's careers, paleontologists' careers especially. And two weeks ago, yeah, we did have the new Spinosaurid, Reparo Venator Milnery. And when I first saw that this was Milnery, I was like, wait a second, I feel like we just covered a Milnery dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And then I went back and I was like, oh, okay, is a that was a Spinosaurid. This is a Coelophysoid. So they are very different animals and found in completely different areas of the UK as well. Interestingly, this find actually includes three individuals. The holotype includes some lower back vertebrae, the sacrum, pelvic girdle, and a femur, which is reasonably okay. For a Triassic specimen, yeah. Unfortunately, there's no skull and we don't have any claws on either the hands or the feet or anything like that, which is a little bit disappointing. So we don't really have a great idea of what it looked like, but it's enough details to assign it as a coelophysoid, which is really important. Originally, there was a report of a hand bone, a few foot bones, and a claw, but those seem to be lost. Oh, that's too bad. These were also lost for a while, and I think, based on some of the reporting, Angela Milner helped them find it because it was in the collections of the Natural History Museum London. Mm -hmm. So I think that's partly how she got it named after her. So maybe they're still hidden away somewhere else in the collections and they just couldn't find them in time for the paper publishing. Hopefully in the future, they'll be able to find them. Then the two other referred individuals basically account to some more back vertebrae and a partial ischium or hip bone. I guess technically it could be as few as two total individuals because maybe those could be from the same one, but they weren't close enough that they thought for sure those two were from the same individual. As expected for a coelophysoid, it is very old and also small. They estimate the femur was about 10 centimeters or 4 inches long. That is small. Yeah. For comparison, I found a study measuring chickens as they grow up. And I think a, a roughly two-month-old chicken, which I think is about how long they take to reach adult size, there weren't any data points beyond that. That chicken was about 8 centimeters long. So like 20% shorter. Oh, that's why you say it's about chicken sized. Yeah, I think some of the descriptions described it as chicken sized too. And I think that's a, a pretty fair comparison. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, though, the femur diameters are reversed. For a chicken, it's about 10 centimeters. And for pen drag, it's closer to 8 centimeters. So the chicken has a 20% beefier femur, but 20% shorter. Hmm. <laughs> so maybe that means that pen drag is like, chicken sized but a little bit lankier and faster yeah potentially possibly one of those chickens with a plunger stuck on its butt <laughs> to give it a tail would also give you a better idea of what it looked like <laughs> unfortunately they didn't have a good way of measuring its maturity because some of the features they wanted to measure weren't included in the fossils oh different things that you look for that are fused they didn't have yeah like especially the skull and teeth and things like that mm -hmm. but they did have 16 features that do correlate to maturity based on other previous studies. So they used, they built on that work and scored relative to other dinosaurs. And they found that eight of the features scored as mature and the other eight scored as immature. <laughs> okay, so maybe it's a subadult. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So they there's like a scale of zero to 20, I think, in maturity. And they were like, it's between a five and a 19 or something. It's a really <laughs> it's wide very range. very variable. Yeah, so it could be like an old juvenile through like almost skeletally mature, basically, somewhere in that range. And of the features that they scored for maturity, they said, quote, none of the characters considered highly informative of maturity, end quote. So there weren't any really great things like how we talk about, oh, this vertebrae has all these fused bits on it, mm -hmm. which really makes it look like it's a skeletally mature individual. They don't have that on this. And coelophysoids in general have a really plastic development. So there, I remember at SVP one year seeing this chart of all the different ways we've seen coelophysis develop, basically. And it's like, a whole crazy series so it's like sometimes their legs develop and fuse first sometimes it's arms sometimes it's head sometimes this part grows faster mm -hmm. sometimes that part grows faster so when you have a partial skeleton it's like you almost know nothing because it's like well yeah this part of the body was developed 
but we don't know what was going on in the other part. And sometimes this part develops first. So it could just be starting to get there. Or it could be the last thing to develop. And it means that it's completely done. So it's so there's just no way to know at this point. Yeah. So unfortunately, even though we know its size, we don't know exactly where it fits in the range of what it would have gotten to. As a quick reminder for our listeners, SVP stands for Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, and it's an annual conference. Yes. So we know that this individual is probably around the same size as a chicken, but we're not sure if that's, it's probably near the maximum side, because like you said, it's probably like an older juvenile in that sort of range. So maybe it wouldn't have gotten as big as a coelophysis, which is still pretty small, relatively speaking, for a dinosaur, but we can't be completely sure. We can learn a little bit, though, about its size by comparing it to other coelophysoids. So for example, it's much smaller than the type specimen of Gojirosaurus, despite being about as mature or possibly more mature. So it seems to be smaller than Gojirosaurus, or at least that individual of Gojirosaurus. Interesting. Yeah. So even within other coelophysoids, I I would say it was fairly small. Pendrag was found in a really interesting location. So it was found in what's called a fissure fill in South Glamorgan, Wales. What's a fissure fill? So basically, a fissure is like a crack, more or less, in rock. And essentially, there was some limestone that was formed in the Carboniferous, which was about 100 million years old at the time of the late Triassic. And it had some fissures in it. So big cracks in it because it's 100 million years old. And some of those cracks got filled with Triassic sediment. Hmm. And in so doing, sometimes those also got filled with Triassic bones. And when it fossilized, we ended up with Triassic rock with Triassic dinosaur fossils in it. And that's the case with Pendrag. It's found in this fissure. But unfortunately, that means that it's really hard to date because usually the way we date rock is with the stratigraphy so it's like a layer cake and you can figure out at this layer it was about this old and then you can map it out across different geographical areas but you can't do that with fissure fills because it's random little things sticking down into the rock so you don't know exactly when they filled Hmm. it's all mixed up basically so we don't have a really good date range for pendrag but we do have sort of an estimate based on other animals that are present in there, because not just dinosaurs, some of the other things are easier to date that are a little more common. And they estimate it to be around the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, plus or minus about 10 to 20 million years. (laughs) So very roughly, it's around 200 million years old, which means that really this could be a, a very early Jurassic find too. It's not necessarily a Triassic find. The authors, though, their best guess is that it is very late Triassic. The really cool thing about these fissure fills, though, is that they're full of lots of bones, although unfortunately they're largely fragmentary and unnamed. Makes sense, considering how they got there. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like getting shoved down into these weird crevices. But they include adosaurs, phytosaurs, crocodilomorphs, sauropodomorphs, theropods, and a quote-unquote enigmatic pseudosuchian. That's a lot of different things. It is. And two of the named dinosaurs are Thecodontosaurus and Pantadraco, Hmm. which I think we've covered both of before Mm -hmm. on the show. These bones for Pendrag were found way back in 1952. Oh, that explains how they were a bit lost for a while. Yeah, exactly. And they were, I, I didn't see a description before 1983. That was when they were described as a theropod. And nothing really more beyond that. Mm -hmm. Then in 2000, they were briefly assigned to the Coelophysid genus Syntarsus, but not to a specific species. And then in 2010, it was referred to Coelophysis, quote, without providing further justification for this assignment, end quote, according to the authors. All right. (laughs) So I guess they didn't really appreciate that (laughs) description. But now it has its official name as Pendrag. It's a good name. Yeah, it is really cool. I'm resisting the urge to try the Welsh pronunciation every time because I feel like I'm butchering it. So I'm just doing something similar enough that I can do. So among the unique features of its skeleton, it's got an unusually long back vertebra, which is about 2.6 times as long as it is high. It's got vertebrae that articulate differently than other early neotheropods. 
And it's got several details of the hips, like angles where the bones meet. So it's got quite a few differences, at least from other coelophysoids. And it's one of these where none of those are 100% unique to this dinosaur. You can find each of those things in a different dinosaur, but you never find those combinations. And certainly not in a coelophysoid. So it's pretty confident that this is a new dinosaur. Phylogenetically speaking, Pendrag is a non coelophysid coelophysoid. <laughs> It's a bit confusing. Yeah, so basically it's like an early member of the coelophysoid broad group. But, but it's it, not specifically a coelophysid. Yeah, which is like a narrower group later on that's more derived. But the group that it's in includes Powell Venator and Luciano Venator. <laughs> I did a Venator and a Venator. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> Sometimes it seems right. I don't know. <laughs> Both of those are from the late Triassic of Argentina, interestingly, which is obviously pretty far away from Wales. Mm -hmm. Back then it was a lot closer, but still not super close. It may have been extra small as a result of island dwarfism, but it, again, could have been small due to age. Or, more generally, coelophysoids seem to have evolved smaller body sizes over time in oh, some weird. cases. So maybe this was part of a general trend. So we really have three different main options for why it's small. And that's weird for a dinosaur. That it got smaller? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially I mean, that early on. It did happen a few times. So like there's the bird shrink mm -hmm. and there's a few other shrinking lineages in dinosaur history. Right. But. And it, I'm sure it has to do with the environment and what kind of food they're going after and all these sorts of factors. But yeah, it's just interesting because usually you think of dinosaurs steadily growing. Exactly. Yeah. So. The shrinking thing you do see on random little pockets, like we have those small theropods and small sauropods, too, on like islands and things like that, and the island dwarfism, which could be the case here. But you do sometimes get it where they're just shrinking due to their niche, like basically with birds. Like they all got smaller and all those early like microraptorines and things like that were shrinking compared mm -hmm. to their ancestors. But you're right, there is that Cope's rule, which is the idea that animals evolve larger over time, especially applied to dinosaurs, since that's Cope's whole deal. This shrinking, or at least not growing, pendrag is another nail in that coffin of Cope's rule. I mean, it didn't need any more nails. It's fully sealed and buried at this point. I was going to say, does anyone talk <laughs> about it still? It comes up sometimes. It's, it is one of those things where some of the last dinosaurs were really big, and some of the early dinosaurs were very small, or all the early dinosaurs were pretty small. So if you just connect those two endpoints, mm -hmm. it's like, look, they're getting bigger. But it's a lot more complicated than that. Right. right. In Cope's defense, I suppose, they didn't know about that many dinosaurs. So. Yeah. We mostly had the endpoints at that time. Yeah. Because the Hell Creek is one endpoint. And then you've got the early stuff from Europe, which was a lot smaller. Although there was some Jurassic stuff, which was bigger than Hell Creek stuff. Anyway. <laughs> There's pretty good support for the coelophysoid shrinking thing that they're proposing. They have a nice little phylogenetic diagram, a little tree of life, and it's color coded by whether things are shrinking or getting bigger. And you see a couple of the different coelophysoid branches shrinking in that Triassic, early Jurassic time frame. Both Powell Venator in Argentina and Procompsognathus in Germany also shrank compared to their ancestors. Interestingly, though, despite its chicken size, it may have still been an apex predator, or at least a high trophically meso predator, which is another thing a lot of the articles focused on, and maybe that connection to T-Rex mm -hmm. in it being like a predator with sharp teeth and stuff like that. Its name is Chief, so feels like it's in charge. Yeah, it's definitely alluding to that sort of high trophic level feature. So they assume that it had the same serrated knife-like teeth that all other coelophysoids have, which is a pretty safe assumption. It's nice when it's a trait that's in all the <laughs> every single member of the group when you're missing that, because then it's like, okay, that's a pretty safe bet that that's what it's like in this individual too, even though we didn't find the bones. And then on top of that, we haven't found any larger terrestrial predators in the ecosystem. 
but that could be a preservation bias from the weird fissure fill fossilization. So maybe big animals didn't make it into the fissures to get fossilized. So we're getting this weird, it's almost like if there was a sieve on top of (laughs) your fossil bed (laughs) and only the small stuff is trickling through it where it can get fossilized. Mm -hmm. But you might expect to find at least like one big bone or two because a lot of times these are just individual bones anyway. Right. So it doesn't necessarily look like they died in the fissure fill. But if it's fragmented enough, it might be hard to tell. Yeah, that's true. And big bones don't move as easily as smaller bones, too. So if they have to travel a little bit to make it to these fissure fills, then maybe the big bones aren't making it there. So, yeah, there's definitely a decent chance that there are larger animals that we haven't found yet. That's, I guess, true in any ecosystem because fossilization is such a crapshoot. But, yeah, we've got a really cool new tiny coelophysoid from Wales now named Pendrag. I like that name. It is a really cool name. Over in the U.S., the president of the U.S. restored environmental protections at Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante Monuments in Utah and and the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts area off the East Coast. Oh, nice. I didn't hear about the Bears Ears. That's really cool. Yeah. There's a lot of fossils in that area. There has been some controversy over the restored protections. There was controversy when those protections were taken away. So makes sense that there's controversy again. But what was really interesting is in a Fizzorg article, Jim Kirkland said, quote, close to 10% of all dinosaurs known in the world are from Utah. <laughs> he is Utah's chief evangelist for <laughs> yeah. paleontology. Yeah, but that's, I think that's a crazy high percentage of dinosaurs. It's a really good place for dinosaur diversity, for sure. Mm-hmm. It helps that they have so many different sites to dig up fossils at. True. And that they have ceratopsians, because ceratopsians just went nuts with diversity. But that's really cool. Yeah, I know at SVP there was a lot of talk when bear's ears basically went away Mm -hmm. because there was so much new paleontology happening there. It was like a recent discovery for some of the sites. Yeah. Yeah, some big dinosaurs had been named from there recently. Yeah. Well, certainly most, if not all, of the paleontologists we know would be excited about that. I think it's safe to say Jim Kirkland is. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> in New Jersey, Rowan University broke ground on the Dinosaur Fossil Park Museum, which I'm pretty sure we talked about this a long time ago. They're going to have a 44,000 square foot facility above the former Marl Quarry where fossils have been found. Hmm. And it's this 65 acre site where more than 50,000 fossils have been found so far. It's an active site, which is cool. It's going to cost about $73 million to build. And it will include a recreated Dryptosaurus, which was found a mile from the site back in 1866. That is quite a construction project. 44,000 square feet, $73 million. Mm -hmm. That is epic. It was a super important spot, though, or still is. Still is, is, yeah. Because that's the spot that Marsh and Cope were originally fighting over. Wasn't that the very impetus of their feud? Like, who had the rights to getting the fossils from that quarry? Cope had started it, and then Marsh kind of slipped in and took over. Yeah. Yeah. And they found tons of dinosaurs there, as well as a lot of aquatic stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. I think we saw a documentary where they were digging there just a couple years ago, pulling out new aquatic material from that quarry. So visitors are going to be able to dig for fossils, and then you can keep some as souvenirs. Unless it's a really big discovery, then they'll keep those for research purposes. Gotcha. Yeah, a lot of times if it's like a tooth or it's a invertebrate that's super common. Or maybe just a tiny bone that you... You can't really get much information out of it. Oh, yeah, like a fragment, Mm -hmm. like just a little bone chip kind of thing. Yeah, sometimes they let you keep that stuff, depending on where you are. Yeah. But sounds cool. I want to visit. Yeah, that's awesome. Because it looks like this marl quarry is just a little bit south of Camden, which also means it's really close to Philadelphia. So it should be relatively easy to visit for a lot of people that are in the area sightseeing. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got pretty close to there when we went to Haddonfield to see where Hattie, (laughs) the the original Hadrosaur mount, was discovered. Yeah, we'll definitely have to go when it's open. Absolutely. They don't have a timeline, though, it sounds like. It's still probably too early. It it just broke ground. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, they broke ground. That's still pretty significant. Yeah. 
So next, thank you to Weiser who shared this one with us. The Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences has a T-Rex exhibit, and it's all about Trix the T-Rex. Trix is about 67 million years old. The skeleton they have is a 3D cast. And this exhibit also includes six interactive displays where you learn how paleontologists work as well as the life of T-Rex. And it's open from now until August 7th of next year, if anyone's in the area. So this next one, it was just an inspiring story I came across, had to share, Garrett. There's this girl in India, Aswatha Viju, who's India's youngest paleontologist. She's only 14 years old, but in the last four years, she's collected 136 fossils. Holy cow. Yeah. That is a lot of fossils. I know, it's amazing. She's collected fossils, at marine invertebrates, vertebrates, including some dinosaur bones, flora, and microfossils, and she's already been giving talks at schools and research institutes and museums about her experiences. Wow. Yeah, very inspiring. That is great. So yeah, you, you're never too young to start. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> that was impressive. And I think this kind of goes to show, you know, there's so many different paths to paleontology, too. Yeah. yeah India, too, doesn't have a ton of dinosaur finds. So there's probably a lot of room for her to carve out opportunities for herself if she's this motivated, which it seems like she is. Yeah. Well, I think there's been more recently, or we've talked about some recently. True. There's but, been some. But you're right. There's still a lot of room for growth. Yeah. India is really interesting because back in the Mesozoic, it was still connected to Africa. So it should have a similar fauna to a lot of what you see in Africa, you'd think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's doing a lot more than I was doing at age 14. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> It's okay. We don't all have to be <laughs> amazing. <laughs> so this last article I want to mention, they looked at Google search data, and one of the most searched for costumes this year is dinosaur. And I think we're in pretty good shape then. We've got a couple of inflatable dinosaur costumes, although I recently found out that they have sauropod inflatable <laughs> costumes. But that's an outdoor costume. Clearly. This is true. Because it's like... There's no room inside, really. It's the same format as like the horse costume with the thing sticking out behind you. Right. Well, you could do it as a just one person. But it takes up too much space. I yeah. mean, it's yeah. like... Well, yeah. It's, turn in a hallway. You can't really walk. I mean, it's hard enough walking around in the inflatable T-Rex costume. Yes. But can you imagine Sorpa costume, Gary? I can imagine it. I don't think anyone should do it indoors, at least. Yeah. What I'm saying is We've if, got you, a backyard. if you buy this, yeah. you're going to have to use it outside. It's an outside toy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look into it. We'll see. <laughs> I like that it's available. It's good to know. We do already have three inflatable dinosaur costumes. And we make great use of them. True. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Nashoibidosaurus which was a request from Brad the Curator via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. It was a Sorolophene hadrosaurid that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now New Mexico in the U.S., found in the Kirtland Formation. Being a hadrosaur, you might guess it's herbivorous. It had dental batteries with hundreds of teeth, and it cropped plants with its beak. It also had a nasal arch that rose above the front of the eyes. That's kind of one of its distinguishing factors. Nasal arch above the front of its eyes. That rose above the front of the eyes, yeah. What does that mean? I guess you could say it's like a really high snout. Oh, interesting. I guess those sorolophines often have that sort of the big snout as an ornament. They're not all like parasorolophus with the huge thing sticking off the back of the head. Some of them keep it in front of the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> True. So the type species is Nashoibitosaurus ostromi, and the genus name means creek lizard. So originally, it was thought to be found in the Nashoibito member of the Kirtland Formation. But the Nashoibito member is now considered to be part of the Ojo Alamo Formation, which is a bit confusing. But I did say at the beginning of this that Nashoibitosaurus was from the Kirtland Formation. And that's because later it was found that Nashoibitosaurus was actually found in an older part of the Kirtland Formation, the Denizen member. So Nashoibitosaurus ended up being a few million years older than previously thought. Interesting. So it's named after a formation or a member which got renamed to something else and then it's not even in that thing after all. Yeah, it was from a different member. So a little confusing. 
The species name, Ostromi, is in honor of John Ostrom, quote, for his work on the cranial morphology of hadrosaurs and for describing one of the taxa from the San Juan Basin, end quote. So a partial skeleton and parts of the skull of Nashoibetosaurus has been found. Part of the holotype was found in the 1970s and 80s. And the holotype includes a lot of the skull. There's also a portion of an articulated cervical series that's unprepared. In other words, neck vertebrae? Mm Mm-hmm. A right humerus, several ribs, and maybe two dorsal vertebrae, but that was uh, questionably included, one of the papers said. So I guess they weren't articulated with the (laughs) neck vertebrae, it was just back vertebrae that were just sort of nearby-ish? Yes. Yeah, the only thing articulated was the cervical series, and that's been unprepared. Jack Horner first described the holotype as a type of critosaurus in 1992 when he described two hadrosaur skulls. But also in 1992, Adrian Hunt and Spencer Lucas, who were unaware of Horner's study at the time, described a lot of the skull and postcrania, but they said that it was Edmontosaurus saskatchewanensis. It sounds like in general they look quite a bit like Edmontosaurus if they were getting synonymized briefly. Yeah. And then in 1993, Adrian Hunt and Spencer Lucas named Nashoibetosaurus. They reassigned the postcrania of what they had previously said was Edmontosaurus to Nashoibetosaurus and included one of Horner's skulls in the holotype. Just how you get the skull and then parts of the skeleton as the holotype. They said that their specimen could not be Edmontosaurus based on the morphology of the skull roof. And they also said that Critosaurus Navahovius was a nomum dubium. They said that the Critosaurus holotype was a poor specimen, as missing parts of the skull that have most of the diagnostic features of hadrosaurs, the things that you can tell them apart with. So in 1993, they named two new genera based on the two hadrosaur skulls that Horner described. So the two genera that they named was Nashoibetosaurus and Anasazisaurus. And they said that these two skulls were from different stratigraphic units. One, they thought, came from the Nashoibeto member, and the other came from pre-Nashoibeto Kirtland formation. <laughs> pre nashoibito They also said there was no evidence that they were the same taxon or ontogenetic variants of each other, you know, that they showed a growth series of the same dinosaur. And that's how they ended up with the two different dinosaur names. Sounds like a lumper might come along. Yeah, there's some lumping and splitting here. So in 2000, Thomas Williamson re-examined the holotype of Critosaurus Navahovius and found it to be valid and, quote, the senior subjective synonym of both Anasazisaurus horneri and Nashoibetosaurus ostromi. And he said that Nashoibetosaurus was not distinguished based on morphological grounds and that it came from approximately the same stratigraphic horizon and part of similar faunas to Anasazisaurus and Critosaurus Navahovius. So he's saying they basically came from around the same time and place. And they look a lot alike. Mm -hmm. So there's a little lumping. Yep. Now, in 2013, Albert Prieto Marquez found Nashoibetosaurus to be distinct, but that Anasazisaurus was a synonym of Critosaurus, but he kept them as a distinct species, so it became Critosaurus horneri. Oh, now we're really getting into it, where things are getting lumped, but not all the way lumped, still Mm -hmm. getting their own species. Well, Nashoibetosaurus was found to be distinct, so that was split. Now, other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Nashoibetosaurus include... Parasaurolophus, Pentaceratops, Zeopelta, Displetosaurus, Ornithomimus, and Sauronithelestes. And our fun fact of the day is that Pendrag Milneray is the third dinosaur named after Angela Milner. Nice. I know she passed away recently, so it seems fitting then to have a lot of dinosaurs named after her. Yeah, she passed away at the age of 73 in August. And so the one that was named two weeks ago, the Spinosaurid Reparo Venator Milnery, was shortly after that. But there was also another dinosaur named after her in 2011, shortly after she retired. That's my guess at why it was named after her, because I think she retired in 2009. Hmm. It was a couple years later. And that one's named 
Veteropristosaurus milneri, or milneri <laughs> in that case. And Veteropristosaurus means old shark lizard in Latin. Sounds fearsome. Yeah, it's interesting. It's not particularly fearsome, but it's a play on words, basically, because Carcharodontosaurids are named after Carcharodon, obviously. Mm -hmm. That's how it starts. And Carcharodon is the genus for great white sharks. And this dinosaur is a Carcharodontosaurid? Yes, it's the old, earliest known Carcharodontosaurid. So it's the old Carcharodontosaurid, but rather than making it like Eo Carcharodontosaurus, they made it Vetera Pristosaurus because they use Latin instead mm. and just made it old shark lizard in Latin. So I thought that was pretty clever. Yeah. And also as a reminder, Angela Milner co-authored the Baryonyx description with Alan Charig, and they work together at the Natural History Museum in London. Cool. When they described Baryonyx, it was reportedly the most complete described dinosaur from England at the time, which is pretty impressive, mm -hmm. especially considering it's a Spinosaurid, and a lot of times those aren't very complete at all. Yeah. But Paul Barrett wrote a really nice obituary for Angela in The Guardian, so I want to talk about some of the highlights of her career. She reconstructed Archaeopteryx's brain. That was one of her big achievements. That was after convincing the Natural History Museum London to buy a CT scanner. <laughs> Ooh, good investment. Yeah, so I think Barrett appreciates that because he's probably used it quite a bit mm -hmm. in his time. I think that was back in the early 2000s when they got it. And by using that, she showed that Archaeopteryx had evolved brain regions for flight control and better vision, obviously starting to get more bird-like than some of the earlier dinosaurs. Just another piece of evidence that Archaeopteryx was a weird dinosaur bird hybrid. <laughs> yeah. Tom Huxley called it. He really did. She also worked in the administration of the Natural History Museum for decades, including overseeing the scientific aspects of the Dinosaur Gallery at Natural History Museum London when it opened in 1992. Oh, nice. I like that gallery. Yeah, it was a really good one. And they said that it's the most popular exhibit in the museum. It gets like 3 million visitors a year. <laughs> so definitely a good achievement there. They also said, quote, Angela also had forays into fossil marine reptiles, lizards, salamanders, turtle eggs, and ancient footprints, end quote. Not even going to make a joke about the turtles and footprints <laughs> and their proximity in that sense. <laughs> it just says ancient footprints. We don't know anything about. True. As a bonus fun fact in honor of Angela, one of the groups she studied were the Nectridians, I think is how they're pronounced. They're not a dinosaur group. It's the group that includes Diplocolis, which is the amphibian with the huge triangle boomerang shaped oh, head. Oh, yeah. I like that one. <laughs> it's really interesting and cool looking and a huge mystery about like why, just why d did this animal exist? <laughs> what, is the, what is going on with it? <laughs> So they likely swam by wriggling a long tail from side to side like an eel or a sea snake. And we think that because it had very short limbs, but it did have a pretty sizable tail. There were several other amphibians that also had that head shape. It wasn't just Diplocolis. <laughs> so there, maybe there is a reason then. Yeah, there's there's got to be some reason it had this big weird head. But Diplocolis was the largest of them at about one meter or three feet long. And its head alone was about eight inches or 21 centimeters long and about 36 centimeters or one foot, two inches wide. <laughs> so like a third as, as it is long, it's that wide. And a lot of that length is tail. So it's really like its head is almost as wide as its torso kind of thing. It's like just a massively wide head. Yep. They don't, they, we really don't know why it had a boomerang shaped head. Yet. No, yeah, yet. There are a lot of really fun hypotheses, though, that I think are worth mentioning. So some of the early hypotheses were that the rear projections, sort of the tips of the boomerang, protected the gills. So, like, I guess that makes sense. If there's gills back there, you could turn your head to protect the gills. Or it helped counterbalance the head weight. That's kind of a weird one because thinking of a boomerang as counterbalance, like I guess, but you don't need to get a boomerang shape to counterbalance. Like there are other ways to achieve counterbalance. So it's kind of funny. Later on, people suggested that the head could be the start of a larger ray like flap for locomotion, which would be the most awesome looking amphibian ever mm -hmm. if it basically had 
a big bony head in the middle and then huge flappy like Dumbo ears. This is like a Dumbo model, basically, (laughs) where the ears are doing the propulsion at the head forward through the water. That would just be amazing. I can't even can't even imagine it. It would be so cool. That one is probably not the case. There's no signs of any soft tissue attachment, unfortunately, on the head. It could have also been used as a giant spade or shovel to burrow. Just, I don't know, digging with your face seems like a strange way to go about it, but maybe. Yeah. And then this one is not a joke, but its head would have made it hard for predators to swallow it. That's probably true. (laughs) There, I've seen like joke comics about it. Like, why does it have this head? And it's like a, you know, theropod like choking on the head trying to (laughs) eat it. To me, the big flaw with that is the rest of its squishy amphibian body is not huge and hard to swallow and you could bite chunks out of it. So unless it's like backed into a burrow, that's not really going to protect it. And they actually did find this burrow in Texas, which was presented at GSA, which is the Geological Society of America, I think, in 2013. And it had at least eight Diplocolis burrows, sort of like separate little burrows, but fossilized in one unit that were oriented with their nostrils near the surface. So basically, they did have their head sort of at the edge of a burrow. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was, you know, the huge head for protection, I suppose. And But you'd always want to have your head near the surface because that's how you breathe. They are vertebrates after all. We all basically breathe through our heads, except for the whole cloacal breathing thing that happens sometimes. (laughs) Then three of the eight Diplocala skulls, though, have bite wounds on their face, And one of them is missing the whole skull. So it wasn't the best protection. No, it clearly didn't really help that much. And then there are also several Dimetrodon teeth around with a whole bunch of other scattered bones where it appears that like, you know, ribs and other chunks of Diplocolis were eaten probably by a Dimetrodon. So there's two non-dinosaurs going at it before dinosaurs evolved. Mm Mm-hmm. It also appears that Dimetrodon tried to pull out a Diplocolis from the burrow. Maybe those ones, all the ones that have the scratches on their snout Mm -hmm. sort of have pole type scrapes on them. And I guess in some of those cases, it was unsuccessful. So maybe that big shovely head gave it some sort of resistance to getting yanked out of a burrow. Could be. And that was the advantage. I don't know. But one last head shaped hypothesis that was recently discovered is that the head shape is a little bit shaped like an airplane wing. So what that means is it could have been used like a hydrofoil, or in other words, hydrofoils are basically underwater wings to create lift while it was swimming. So it's a big bony head. Maybe that made it a little bit heavy, but if you shape it like a wing when you're swimming along with your weird tail propelled swimming, the head... (laughs) acts as a wing to lift up the body and keep you sort of going in the right direction. Interesting. Yeah. But a fascinating group of animals that Angela Milner was interested in, so I thought it was worth mentioning. Yeah. And on that note, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. If you want to hear more about other prehistoric animals, maybe it'll be amphibians, maybe it'll be something else, then... Join our Patreon now because we will be covering some bonus non-dinosaur but most likely Mesozoic animals that come out of the SVP, Society of Vertebrate Paleontology Conference, that's coming up. That'll be bonus content for our patrons. So all you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash Thanks again and until next time. You could tell.